Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the Bar Council Family Legal Aid Seminar. You're going to be in very good hands this, this evening and we'll, we'll have a very informative discussion from some extremely experienced uh, panelists who are strong on their subject matter. Um, we have um, three panelists, Scott Baldwin, Rob Damiao and Charlotte Flanders who will all be uh, speaking to you about varying topics. But before uh, I introduce them and their subjects, uh, I'm just going to deal with some important housekeeping issues that should help you uh, and help us have a smoother seminar this evening. First of all, um, you'll be pleased to know that we'll be sharing the presentation slides after the webinar and anything that you therefore see up on the screen uh, when our speakers are presenting will be made available to you. The webinar is also being recorded and you'll uh, the availability of that um, will be shared with you as well. A, a link will be sent to you in the coming days. Um, all of you as participants uh, and attendees today will be muted, um, but you can put all of your questions through the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, please try and identify that. I'm sure you're all familiar with Zoom and, and the use of that function. What I would ask though is please don't put your questions in the chat uh, room because we won't be looking there for questions and your questions uh, may be missed. You can put your questions up with your name on it or if you prefer you can put your questions up uh, anonymously by selecting the anonymous button. We have had some questions uh, sent to us in advance and our uh, experienced speakers have done their best to incorporate those questions into the presentations uh, that they're going to be giving this evening. Uh, but if you feel that your question hasn't been dealt with uh, as an advanced question, please feel free to add uh, or clarify anything that we haven't dealt with. Uh, our speakers will do their very best to get through uh, as many of your questions as possible. The aim is to try and get through all of the questions. So we'll move swiftly through when we get to the question and answer sessions. Having um, very briefly identified who our speakers are this evening, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about uh, the subject matters that they'll be speaking about. Uh, Scott Baldwin, who is going to begin, will give you a whistle stop um, tour through the BHCC family billing, and he'll be looking at uh, best practice. Uh, Rob Damiao, who joins us from the Legal Aid Agency, is going to be giving general hints and tips on uh, legal aid claims, and he'll be looking into the future of um, the IT uh, at the Legal Aid Agency, and there'll be some changes there. Um, and Charlotte will uh, conclude and give her a talking presentation uh, at the very end. Um, just a little tiny bit about each of our speakers. Those of you that have joined us before will know that all of our speakers uh, have uh, presented um, before, but um, we're very fortunate to have these speakers back with us again this year. Uh, and Scott, um, you may know, and if you don't, I'll tell you, is the Chief Executive at St Mary's Chambers, a specialist family set based in Nottingham. He's a member of the Institute of Barristers Clerks Management Committee. He's on the Bar Council Remuneration Committee uh, and the Bar Council Regulatory Review Working Group. And he works with the Legal Aid Agency on improving training um, and guidance and processes relating to CCMS and BHCC. Uh, and so Scott is very familiar with uh, the complexities of uh, legal aid billing. Um, we also have Rob, and we're very fortunate that Rob's giving up his time to join us this evening, who, as I said, it joins us from the Legal Aid Agency. He uh, is a well-established um, uh, member of that organisation. He's been working with them um, for uh, close to 10 years now, and he's approaching uh, that anniversary. He began as a caseworker uh, straight from university, and um, for some years now, he has been a subject matter expert for civil billing. And um, what that really means is that he knows his stuff uh, and uh, he'll be able to give us a lot of very useful insight and guidance. Uh, and he has a particular expertise in family legal aid. Um, uh, and having heard Rob speak before, I know that uh, his input will be tremendously useful to all of you. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, Charlotte 
who again has spoken uh, at these uh, seminars in the past. Uh, again, very fortunate to have Charlotte here. She is a cost lawyer uh, and also a barrister, albeit a non-practicing barrister. Uh, she has a great deal of experience uh, in her field and um, she's dealt with all sorts of complexities in relation to family legal aid billing and particularly high cost matters. And so again, I'm sure she's going to be a tremendous asset to us this evening, uh, helping and answering your difficult and complex questions. Uh, she's on a number of committees, including the Association of Cost Lawyers Legal Aid Group. Um, without uh, any further uh, uh, to do, I am going to hand over to our first speaker because the most important uh, matter tonight is that you hear from them. Uh, and then you have a chance to put all of your questions, which I know will be the most important aspect of today's um, seminar. So I'm going to hand over to Scott now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I'll just try and get my slideshow up and running so you can all see what's going on. <clears throat> so there we go. Great. You should be able to see the slides. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, VHCC family cases and best practice in managing them. Um, VHCC cases are not difficult to manage now. The LAA have greatly improved how they work. Uh, it is possible in the vast majority of cases to get paid very quickly, um, but you do need to have uh, good lines of communication open and you need to have proper processes in place to manage them. So the starting point is the rules. Um, the LAA guidance is available on their website. There are separate rules and guidance for single and two council cases. Uh, it's important to understand the FGF rules um, for two council cases, which um, fall short of the 11 day mark for events. Um, and it's also important to understand fully costed cases. They are very rare. They, it's, they're not in many cases, but the rules are very, very different for, sing, uh, for fully costed cases and you need to understand them. So um, why is it important to know the rules? So when a, a case plan goes to the LAA, it currently takes 27 days to process it. If you've made a mistake somewhere in or you're claiming something you shouldn't be, it goes to the solicitor, they have to do their bit with it, then it goes to the LAA, the LAA spend 27 days processing it and getting through it, then it gets rejected, it goes back to the solicitor, however long it takes them to read it and then send it back to you to correct and back again. So this is creating lots of extra work and lots of delay. And when we're talking about VHCCs, we're talking about cases worth tens of thousands of pounds. So it's really important that you get it right first time. You also need to consider you might be claiming more than's allowed. Um, and if you do that, you're in the position where a barrister is going to be in the position of ending up owing the LAA uh, money, which is not a good position and nobody wants to be there. So make sure you understand the rules and make sure you bill it correctly. Don't try it on. The rules are there for a reason. They're very clear. Um, there are some bits of flexibility in the rules um, and where you can use those, you need to provide justification to the LAA to explain what you're claiming and why. So there's a couple of examples there. Following a, an appeal from a fact-finding hearing where a rehearing is ordered, it is possible, especially in two council cases, to ask the LAA to allow for extra advocates meetings and conferences for the rear hearing. Um, and then underruns for vacated hearings, this is uh, particularly if uh, the case has gone off for a long time, it's been adjourned off for a long time, it's possible to ask the LAA to allow underruns for those in lieu of wasted preparation. And it's especially useful where you've got a case where original counsel is not available for the adjourned hearing. Their, their uh, underruns are specifically wasted preparation. So you can uh, apply to the LAA for those, but you do have to provide justification and that has to go through the solicitor in the case plan. So make sure you provide that. Um, preparation and, and communication are absolutely key, as I said. Um, if you do your preparation right, things will run smoothly and you'll have everything ready to go when the time comes and you'll get paid quickly. Um, barristers and clerks absolutely must work as a team. Um, it, it needs to both of you to work together to understand what's going on with the case, identifying them, uh, making sure they're billed properly, getting paid properly. Um, and it's also important to consider uh, the other side of it which is the solicitors and the LAA so you've got to have open up lines of communication with the solicitors they are your conduit to the LAA make sure you're talking to the right person because if you try and communicate with a busy care lawyer they're probably in court all day or seeing clients all day 
and they won't necessarily pick up an email from council asking something about a VHCC that they haven't got time to deal with. It's probably their secretary that deals with it or an internal cost lawyer or an external cost lawyer. So make sure you're talking to the right person because that can cause great delays. Um, don't be afraid um, to challenge someone if you think they're wrong. If you know the regs and you've read your rules and you've got it right, challenge them. Be polite about it. There's no need to be an idiot. But challenge them if you think they're wrong, quote the regulations back at them, and also be prepared to accept that you may be dead wrong yourself. Even I get things wrong from time to time, I have to admit, and, 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 and it's embarrassing when you do, but just hold your hands up and say, oops, got this one wrong. Um, but I think that the really key thing is having systems in place to manage cases. So you need to identify VHCCs at the earliest possible opportunity. You've got to manage the case throughout, which means interim case plans possibly. You need to look at claiming payments on account when you can and being fully prepared for the final bill when that time comes. You also, as clerks, need to manage expectations with your barristers and the barristers, you need to understand how these things work and um, because some VHCCs bills can get held up. It is possible for the vast majority of, of, of VHCC claims to be paid very, very quickly, but there are times when things get held up. Now, that could be that the solicitors aren't doing what they need to do. It could be that you're making mistakes in what you're sending them, which is causing parts of the delays. It could be that it's not a standard VHCC. It's a fully costed case plan, which is causes your sorts of extra problems. So that's one thing. And you should also think about really are you claiming at the right rate? Is it events or is it not? The the 11 day uh, trigger for events is the key thing. If you've got something that's hovering in between, be careful. Uh, I mean, I think, I think I would say. I've had a number of situations where, where barristers have come to me with a, an eight day fact finder or a nine day fact finder and saying, when the final hearing is listed, this is going to go more than 11, more than 10 days when the final hearing is listed. What if it doesn't? What if the case changes and it ends up being nine or 10 days? Then you're not on events. You need to understand the regs on that and, and think about it carefully. Um, spotting VHCCs early is where the barrister clerk team really comes in. So if you're a barrister and you're dealing with a case and you know that there are going to be 10 interveners in this case and there are going to be 10,000 pages of evidence or it's an extremely complex case, you need to be talking to your clerks and warning about it so that they can get prepared and send information to the solicitors at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, for Clerks, you can look for cases that have lengthy time estimates when they're in the diary or with large bundles. These are obvious signs that this case could be something which might become VHCC. You've always got to bear in mind that for single council cases, it's the costs that are the trigger. It's got to get over 25,000 costs, barristers, solicitors and disbursements, not including VAT. But for two council cases, as soon as the LAA grant authority for two council, it is high cost, but it's not necessarily events unless it goes over the 10 days. So you've got to think about those. And for barristers and clerks, is it a case which warrants two council? So if the local authority has instructed Silk and Junior, there's a very good chance if your client is a perpetrator or in the pool of perpetrators that you should be applying for two council, either Silk and Junior or, or two juniors. So think about that. Is it that type of case? And for barristers, if you are um, applying for two counsel, make sure you liaise with your clerks before you do it so that they can start putting all the preparation in place so that it's ready to go. Um, if you're not sure if a case is registered as VHCC, there are a couple of tricks. You can um, go on to CCMS, start a claim. When you start a claim manually, one of the options you get, it will say, do you wish to claim for fees that were before this case was registered as VHCC? You then know it's definitely registered at VHCC and in single council cases that there's a cost limit of 32 and a half thousand and in two council that's 60,000 cost limit. So you know that's already been done. Um, in two council cases, you absolutely must have a copy of the CCMS notification that's sent to the solicitors telling them what authority has been granted. If you don't have that, you are running the risk of claiming for things that you're never going to get paid for for, for a, a leading council. That's scary because that's tens and tens of thousands of pounds. So you've absolutely got to make sure that's nailed on. Do not rely on the legal aid certificate. Don't rely on anything other than the CCMS notification. This is really important because generally the LAA will grant authority for two council for a portion of the case, usually just fact finding. It won't automatically cover an appeal if there's an appeal from only that fact finding. You might get uh, authority just for an appeal, which would then wouldn't follow on for the final hearing. You've got to look to extend it if that crops up. So bear that in mind with, with two council cases. Um, souls are not always aware that a case might be coming VHCC. So you have to open up those lines of communication with them at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, in, in single council cases, a good way of doing that is to look at 
how long the case is going to run for, what the costs would be at fast rates, and therefore whether you think that together with the solicitor's costs are going to send you over the 25,000 limit. I work on the principle of about 50-50. So if my costs are over 12 and a half grand, I know the solicitors are probably going to be the same. So we're well over that 25 mark. Um, so 10 to 12, you're probably okay in terms of estimated. Send them a cost estimate at fast rates and events rates so they can see them side by side and they can see what the likely uh, hood is of a case exceeding 25,000. Um, in two council cases, as I said, it's automatically high cost as soon as authority is granted. But what you've got to be aware of is that two council cases can eat up that 60,000 cost, 60, cost limit extremely quickly. Um, 14 events completely wipes out that 60 grand. So if you've got a 15 day fact finding, not including any events that might have happened before that, before the, the leading councils involved, you've already gone through that 60,000. So if you've not got an interim case plan in, you're not gonna be able to claim payments on account when you get to the end of the fact finding. So you've got to nail that down. You also need to look to send um, uh, cost estimates in when the timetable changes significantly. If the case is suddenly running longer, then it's going to increase the cost limit. There might not be enough there. So keep bear that in mind. It's especially key in single council cases where they just keep pootling along. Cases which just keep running and running, make sure you keep updating the solicitors. Um, and obtain key documents as the case goes along. We all know that we need to have back sheets and attendance notes for, for conferences and advocates meetings. Get them when they happen. Get a signed CAF form as soon as you possibly can and consider creating a template on your own systems to make it easier to, to create CAF so that you can get them and ready to go for when the time comes for the final bill. Um, check the timetable throughout the case. As I've said before, if the timetable is going to significantly change, then the cost estimate might cost limit might be an issue. Uh, and you need to bear that in mind. Set reminders when you, you can claim payments on account at key stages. That's really important. You know, don't just leave it to chance, claim them when you can. Um, and also bear in mind cases that are hovering around that 11 to 10 day mark. Make sure that you've got those in mind. One of the key things that I diarise is the IRH or the PHR prior to the, the main hearing, either the fact finder or the final hearing. It's quite often at those hearings where the time estimate will change. And if that's more than five days before that, that hearing starts due to start, that might affect whether you can claim events. You've got to, to look at that. Uh, and when you get to payment on accounts, um, obviously, you've got to request the cost allocation from the solicitors, but also have a system to chase it and escalate if they're not responding. But also bear in mind what we said earlier about communicating with the right person. A busy cost lawyer is not going to bother with a cost allocation request from a, a barrister's clerk when they've got 100 emails to deal with for cases that come up in the next few days. So make sure it goes to the right person. Um, when you create the POA1, uh, it needs to show the total cost of the events. Um, but when you send that POA1 to the LAA, you need to indicate what you're actually claiming at that stage. So if you've had fast payments, if you've had previous payments on account, make sure you indicate in the email to the LAA what the balance is that you're claiming from that POA so that you, they don't accidentally overpay you. Really make sure you nail that one down because you don't want to get overpaid when there's no need to. So when the case is concluded, as soon as possible, you need to prepare a final fee note and send it to the solicitors with all the, the relevant documentation they need. The best way uh, uh, to do that is to go through a checklist and make sure you've checked all these things off. So look at overruns. Are any of the events that you've claimed as full events that are on the main hearing days actually overruns? Did they overrun from the actual um, estimated time that was ordered at the last order before the final hearing? Are there any underruns that you've missed? Are there any dates that were vacated partway through the hearing that you claim underruns for? Understand the rules on written submissions and make sure that you only claim them when you can. Um, and uh, bear in mind that that's, that's different for two council and single council cases. In single council cases, always be aware, is it a high court case? Because there is a, a higher rate to claim for events for high court cases. So make sure you've checked, is it high court? Advocates meetings and conferences, there are different rules for two council, single council, but also bear in mind that they're different from FAS and specifically the FAS COVID regulations, which allow advocates meetings to be retrospectively ordered. You cannot do that in VHCC cases, they have to be ordered in advance. So if you've got a case which is converted from FAS over to high cost, you may find that some of those advocates meetings you're not going to be able to claim for because they weren't ordered by the court in advance. Travel expenses you can claim for, but in line with current legal aid regulations, make sure you check the civil electronic handbook and you have to include justification. The best way is on the fee line itself, it set out the justification as you would do normally for a, a fast claim. If you're asking for something from the LIA which requires um, greater exp exp explanation, justification, make sure you provide as much information as possible, set it out in a separate document. 
Um, so I'm thinking there about claiming underruns, that kind of thing. Um, and when you've done all that, send it all off to the solicitor. Um, remember that for two council cases which are less than uh, ten, uh, less than eleven days, you'll need a claim five as well if it's an FGF claim. Um, send it all off to the solicitor. Send it off with your back sheets, the attendance notes for advocates meetings, um, assigned council's acceptance form if one hasn't already been sent, that your justification, your final fee note. Send it all off to them and then say to them, please send me a copy of your draft final final case plan before it goes to the LAA. Make sure you both agree it before it goes to the LA because if it goes to the LAA and they've missed uh, a refresher off for you or something off for you that gets agreed by the LAA, then comes back and you get it and you go, oh, that's not right. They then have to go back to the LAA and start that process again, which is a nightmare. So make sure you've got it from them before they send it to the LAA. When you get to the time to submit final bill, both solicitor and council must submit their final bills at the same time virtually within five working days of each other. So you've got to make sure all the bits are done in advance get a copy of the agreed final case plan. So you've seen the draft, now you get the agreed one. Once the solicitors have agreed it with the LAA, get the agreed one, check it again against your fee note, make sure it matches. Final bill should be submitted fairly soon after that. Solicitors might be collecting a few little bits of information, but it should be relatively soon thereafter. You can wait until they're ready to submit, or you can prepare a draft bill on CCMS yourself. That way you can check it all in advance, you can get it all set up, and when the solicitor says you're good to go, you just hit submit. Though the one thing to be aware of there, if you do that, um, they do get deleted after 84 days if there's no activity. So you might want to set yourself up a reminder to nip back into it, check through the, 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 the options again, and then come out of it. That resets the 84 day time limit again, makes it work again. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I flipped off there. Um, make sure that when you get the cost assessment, if it, uh, includes an offsetting of an FAS claim against the full claim that you tell your solicitor your bill has not been reduced. I get contacted every time that happens because they think it's been taxed down because the first page shows that they've what you've claimed and what they've paid are different but that's only because you've already been paid some of it via FAS claims so it's the best thing to do is to tell the solicitors and save that bit of hassle and extra time um, with them panicking thinking they're going to have to do an appeal of some sort. So that about concludes it for me. I'm, I'm sorry, that was whistle top and I've gone slightly over by a minute. Sorry, Rob, I thought I was going to be shorter. Um, so I will now uh, hand you back to Shiva, who can carry on with the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. That was really helpful. And just to our attendees, uh, please don't worry um, because of the pace we're having to move through material. Uh, if there are uh, issues that were not clear to you from Scott's presentation, um, you can ask and we'll expand on um, those issues in the question and answer. Um, over to Rob now, thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. I'll just uh, do the same as Scott and make sure that I can bring the um, bring my presentation up, uh, which you should all now be able to see. Um, so as Sheila said, my name is Rob. Um, thank you very much as well for those very kind words. Hopefully I can live up to uh, those, those very high expectations now. Um, this is the third year I've been here to talk to you guys at Bar Council. So, Thank you very much for having me back again. Um, we're always happy to come out and talk to you guys, share best tips and, and guidance from ourselves and, and answer questions directly from you as well. You know, we, we don't want to be a closed shop. We do want to be, uh, you know, an open organisation that you can approach and that you can ask questions to as well. Um, I'm going to talk to you today really about four different topics. So I'm going to do basically what I'm calling the boring stuff, which is remote hearings and evidential guidance and POA changes. Then I'm going to talk about something a little bit more interesting, which is apply and the future of... Um, legal aid IT systems. And then I've got a list of useful contacts to give you um, at the end of the presentation as well, which hopefully will help you resolve some queries um, that you may have uh, that you'd like to direct to us as well. Um, I believe these slides are gonna be shared as PDF. So you can, um, when you get a copy of them, you can just click on the, the header here and it'll jump you right to the section. So if you're not interested in reading about POAs and family cases, you just wanna go straight to the useful contacts, just click on that link and it'll take you straight there. So the first thing is remote hearings and evidential requirements. I'm going to talk here quickly about what are the requirements, what are the common mistakes, and how you can help us say yes. Um, you'll probably see that some of this is quite similar, probably stuff that you already know. Um, this was one of the first things we looked at last year, really, um, when lockdown was first introduced. It feels about 300 years ago at this point. Um, we realised pretty swiftly that the old evidential requirements we had for simply weren't going to be um, operational in a world where remote hearings were the, were the norm. So in conjunction with HMCTS, uh, with the Bar Council, with FLBA, and with solicitor bodies as well, like ACL uh, Resolution and the Legal Aid Practitioners Group, we drafted um, the guidance which we've got published and linked to below. 
Um, it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Generally, court orders are our preferred evidence for the length of time, and the courts are generally very open to recording the times uh, and any necessarily, necessary bolt-ons as well in, in the court order. If you can't get the court order, then an attendance note is acceptable as an alternative or a supplementary evidence as well. I will quickly add, if we request evidence, please do provide it. Um, we are the paying authority, so we are therefore entitled to see any evidence we need to verify the payment. It doesn't happen very often, but we have had a couple of instances where uh, people have refused to provide information because they're perhaps worried that there's um, some sort of data protection implication, uh, but there isn't for a legal aid case. I'm sure Charlotte will be able to verify from a solicitor's point of view that for things like court orders, you know, we've been seeing those on cases as a matter of routine for since, you know, since time immemorial, really. They really help us contextualise what's happened in the case and understand uh, what the court specifically is getting at when they're directing things. So if we do request evidence, please do, please do provide it uh, because we do need that evidence for a reason. Uh, if you want to follow and want to read any of the guidance directly, again, the links are there, so you can just click on them and go through to the guidance and, and read those. Uh, we'll briefly, we'll just touch on those. Um, in what I refer to as a, an amazing uh, bit of prescience on our behalf when we were drafting the cost assessment guidance uh, for the 2018 version, it does include a passage um, which is here on the on the what is the right of my screen, um, which uh, does confirm that we can accept alternative evidence outside the EX50, EX506, the aggregate attendance form, the FAS form, whichever you want to call it, um, in remote hearings. So that it is detailed there in the guidance, and we have tried to expand on that as well. As I've said, the hearings, the approved order uh, is generally what we would like, but an attendance note is acceptable. And for advocates meeting, an endorsed brief or copy of the order listing the meeting, uh, which can be endorsed electronically, and the same for conferences as well. So in terms of what that means in practicality, in terms of common errors, these are really the three things that we see a lot at legal aid agency. Uh, firstly, advocates meetings. These must be directed by the court. An advocates meeting arranged by the parties without court direction is, strictly speaking, under the rules of FAS, not an advocates meeting. It may make perfect sense in terms of the progression of the case, but the contract is quite clear in its definition that it must be directed by the court. Um, it can take place the same day as an interim hearing, but must be evidenced as being outside the calculation that you're using for that hearing fee under the FAS. Um, we do know that under remote hearings in, in the new world, um, the court have a tendency to sometimes make in their very first order, they'll say, you must hold an advocate's attendance meeting before, before every hearing um, in a care case. Where they've done that, that's perfectly acceptable for us. We're quite content with that. But do remember that we've probably not seen that order. If the solicitor has attended the first hearing themselves, then we're not going to see a copy of that order right until the end of the case. So actually, if you can get a copy of that order where it says a hearing and an advocate's meeting before every hearing will be held um, and send it to us with your bill, that's really, really helpful because that helps us confirm that this is a properly court-directed advocate's meeting. Uh, conference fees. Um, CTMS is actually quite helpful in this respect because it will not let you claim over the contractual limit. Uh, but in terms of evidencing them, what we find is that we'll sometimes be missing the evidence that confirms the conference is a separate, um, a separate event that's taken place outside the hearing. So if you have a hearing that starts at 10 o'clock, for example, but you've had a conference with the client from 9 till 9.45, that's a separate event. But we need to see in the evidence the separate recorded time so we can confirm that that's not being used to calculate both the FAS fee and the conference fee as well. They have to genuinely be separate events when they're on the same day. And finally, final hearings. Now these happen, the errors on these happen a lot less than they do on, on the first two issues, but obviously they're quite uh, a little bit more impactful because if you're missing out on a 600 pound fee because the final hearing is not in scope, that's obviously a really big issue. Um, so I would say, please make sure to check the scope of the certificate for any work you're about to undertake and you should be provided a copy of that uh, with the brief for any legal aid funded work. So if you haven't got a copy of that, please do request a copy of that from the instructing solicitor. In terms of some other interesting issues that have arisen, so these aren't necessarily things that get pe people get wrong, but they are issues that happen and therefore worth, worthwhile of discussion. Uh, in terms of cost of attending, you kind of got to think about it, how it would be in the old world. So we can't pay for your season pass, but we can pay for you to travel to court for an individual hearing. On, that, on those lines, that means we can't pay for a Zoom license um, or a Teams license or anything like that. But if you incur a BT meet me fee um, at, the court's at the court's direction to attend a hearing, then we can pay for that. Email hearings are a thing that we were surprised we were asked about, but it turns out they are very definitely a thing. So this is where the court hears the um, proceedings by email, basically. And where that happens, that is absolutely fine. Um, on the examples we've seen, the court verified the time in the order, and that was fine. We could pay that. 
we did think about what would happen if the court didn't certify those times in the order as well and where that happens if you can send us a copy of the emails then we can use that to make a judgment call on if the time claimed is reasonable or not and the, the hearing is as long as the hearing is for those if the hearing takes you know 90 minutes then you get your hearing unit two fee and the hearing takes 45 minutes it would be the hearing unit one fee it doesn't matter that it's heard by email it just matters that it was heard basically and the last one that's worthwhile discussion is hearings that are heard on the papers these are mostly ex parte um, and seem to be happening more and more now uh, we believe it's probably the court thinks it's a very efficient way of dealing with an ex parte one um, ultimately where this happens we, we will pay a hearing unit one fee for these um, essentially the hearing has taken place it's just been on the papers so if you do get one of those Probably more for, more for solicitors for yourselves, but than for yourselves. But I did think it was probably worth mentioning just in case you did see it. So yeah, hearings said on the papers, you can claim hearing unit one um, in and that, in those events. I will say, obviously, twenty first of June is the government's uh, proposed date for um, removing all restrictions. However, we don't believe that remote hearings are going away anytime soon. So this guidance is going to continue to be valid um, for the foreseeable future. Really, we have no plans to withdraw it at the minute. Um, interesting peek behind the curtain, really. I say interesting, uh, it depends on your definition. Uh, the EX50, the FAS form, isn't actually a legal aid form, it's a court form. So it's not up to us whether it's withdrawn, it's up to HMCTS of whether it's withdrawn. And we're open to it being withdrawn. Uh, we've got a little bit of work to do around assurance, but the this may well be the future of FAS evidence, really. Um, if that's something that would go down well with the profession, then that's feedback we'd love to hear because we're totally open to working with you guys if you would like this to be the future. It has generally worked for us and we're open to it continuing. Um, so it's worth moving on. We've got some POA changes. Uh, we changed the POA rules for, and these will apply to family cases as well, where you're paid at hourly rates. Obviously, there's no POAs in FAS cases, but where you're paid at hourly rates, uh, you can claim the POA before the, the final bill. Uh, we've increased from 75% to 80% of your costs incurred. You can now claim uh, three months after the, the certificate was issued rather than 12 months, uh, but that is still limited for three years. You can claim once every three months rather than once every 12 months. And we have continued to retain the rule that you can have one final POA if the claim is not finalised within six months of finishing. And CCMS will calculate that for you as well based on the date of taxation you enter. Really important point to note with POAs as well is that CCMS will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, so this is outside of the high cost ones. This is for your, your routine. So you're representing a child uh, in a 16.4 in a matter. It's paid at hourly rates rather than FAS. In those cases, if you're claiming a POA, CCMS will work it out for you. It's got all of this programmed into it. It knows if you're outside the payment window. It knows if you're claiming prematurely. It will, I, and it will tell you as soon as you try and create the POA, if you can or not. It also works out how much you're due based on um, what you're so you have to enter in your current total of cost so don't enter in what you think you're due enter in your current total and TCMS will deduct what's already been paid and work out 80 percent and pay you that so you don't need to do any of the heavy lifting um, and you only need to contact us if you've entered in your running total of costs and it's then not matching what you expect if you put in what you are expecting CCMS will base its calculations on that rather than the true figure if you need any guidance on POAs, I've laid it out for you here. So we've got the handbook, chapter 15.3 in particular, uh, discusses POAs for council. We've got the CCMS picture guide, if you're not sure on how to put it into CCMS itself. And we've also got the VHCC scenario guide and FAQ, which my colleague Stephen drafted in conjunction with Scott. Um, so I can very much verify and testify that that is a very useful piece of guidance. So please do, please do refer to that if you've got any VHCC POAs that you've got a scenario you're not sure of, because it does answer pretty much every question you could have. Um, so that's kind of the boring bit, really. Uh, the, help, the stuff that's probably boring, but actually is kind of the bread and butter of family work, so it's really useful for you to know. Now we're going to talk about what should, in theory, be the more interesting bit, um, which is about apply and the future of legal aid, and specifically how that is going to impact on you as counsel. So essentially, apply is a new online service being developed to handle legal aid applications. At the minute, we've got uh, 48 solicitor firms signed up across the country and they've sent 3,500 applications to us so far. At the minute, we're only doing domestic violence proceedings, and that's very specific domestic violence proceedings as well. So it doesn't include if the certificate covers domestic violence and contact, as they often do. It's very specifically just the domestic violence proceedings. We are looking to expand that, though, currently. We're developing it on what is known uh, as the lean process. Uh, it's being developed by our digital team internally, and the analogy they like to use is skateboard scooter bicycle car and the idea is you develop your skateboard simple plank of wood wheels you make sure it works you test it you get feedback and once you're happy with it 
then you develop your scooter. So that's obviously a step up. It's a skateboard with a stick, basically. Um, and you do the same again. You check that and you make sure it works. And when you're happy with that, you do your bicycle and then you do your car. And what this means is it means that we can test the system thoroughly with its users. We can make sure that we're making any changes that are required are rolled out before it goes out wider. And it allows us to involve the user directly in shaping how apply works as well. And this is probably the disappointing part, I'm afraid. In terms of impact on you, it's not going to have any impact on you. Apply is for applying for legal aid. Um, it interfaces with CCMS, basically. Once that certificate has been issued, then it is in CCMS. So if you are claiming any, if you are the solicitor or even claiming a POA, you still do that through CCMS. And that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future, really. Uh, you know, we're taking our time with Apply and we're making sure we do it right. We're not doing CCMS rollout again. We will put our hands up and say we did not do an especially good job with that. Um, so please do. Uh, rest assured that we're doing it right, we're doing it slowly, and we will fully consult with you when the time comes for you to be on board with whatever comes next. But for now, we're just focusing on apply, and that means the impact on you is going to be quite low. You may well have already done work on a certificate that's been granted under apply because it looks and is exactly the same for you guys. It's just a CCMS case as normal. Um, I thought I'd finish up with some useful contacts as well, because a few of the questions we got were about um, who to contact at LAA when you've got different issues. So I've come up with a different list here. And, you know, I can totally understand why it's confusing because there's a lot of contact points. So hopefully this will be um, helpful for you, for you guys as well. I think really the, the most basic one is if you have a query on a CCMS case, send us a general inquiry in CCMS. And you can please tell us the client uh, name and or the reference number. That means we can link it to the case as well. And you can send these to us um, about a specific case, even if you can, can no longer access that case on CCMS. We can attach it to that case ourselves and they will help us understand the questions being asked. Uh, a common one we would get, for example, is who you contact if um, you were assigned to a certificate, but the solicitor had um, gone, had gone uh, intervened, was bankrupt, was no longer instructed. And you could ask us whether you could get paid on that case through a general inquiry on a case-by-case -case basis in CCMS. Likewise, if you've got a query on an old paper claim, you can email us at Contact Civil, and there is an email address there for High Cost Family. So this is the team that was formerly known as VHCCC, but is now High Cost Family. Um, and they have two contact, different email addresses for both of them that you can use to contact. I will quickly say, if you have a CCMS case just on a normal certificate, please don't email us because the chances are we're not going to pick that up. Um, if you can keep CCMS specific correspondence in CCMS, that's really helpful for us. And it means we can respond to you in a couple of days. So it's much, much easier for us. Really important one is LAA civil claim fix. If you think we've returned a claim to you incorrectly, you can challenge us. We will put our hands up and say we're wrong when we're wrong, and we'll give you advice on how to avoid it in the future. We'll respond to any challenge in 24 hours as well. So please do. Uh, if you think we've rejected any claim uh, for you guys, if you think we've done it wrong, challenge us, and we will hold our hands up and apologize when we've got it wrong. Because you know we do, we're a large organization. We deal with thousands of claims and we make mistakes, and we want to help fix those when we do make those mistakes. If you're unsure on a process on CCMS, our new training and support website is linked to you there as well. Full picture guides, everything for you to access, um, really useful. It replaces the CCMS training website, so please do use that. On there as well is a link to our live chat with online support. Um, so you can speak to us through a live chat function if you've got any questions about CCMS. Um, you, they will respond to you and help you fix any issues. If you want to know about your financial statement, contact payment information. And if you need to register or change any details that you have uh, that we have for you, then contact provider records. And the very last thing I've got to talk about here, very quickly, I'll just do a quick plug for our social media channels. Really good way of keeping up to date with changes and guidance. Uh, we've got our corporate Twitter handle. We've got our customer service Twitter handle. And if you prefer the long form of LinkedIn as well, you can absolutely um, follow the link there and follow us on, on LinkedIn. Join the network. I'm not on LinkedIn. I'm not sure what the terminology is there. You can follow us on Twitter, though. Um, so that's everything I had to talk about today. Hopefully that's been useful. I've definitely gone over 15 minutes, so I do apologise to everyone. Uh, but I will now pass back to Sheila. Thanks. That's, uh, that's great, Rob. That was really helpful. Um, can I just um, remind people that we've got the question and answer function? Um, I can't see any questions in, in there yet, but do feel free to start adding in your questions uh, now so that we're ready to move straight into that when uh, Charlotte finishes uh, her presentation. So over to Charlotte now, thank you. Good evening everyone and thank you very much for having me back. I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me.
I'm here to talk to you about getting it right the first time. Um, and this isn't just in terms of getting it right with billing, but also the importance of getting it right when it comes to actually drafting the court orders when you're at court, because of the knock-on impact that this can have on solicitors and also when we come to drafting our bills. So um, I hope you'll find it interesting. So how can barristers adversely impact on providers? Well, in a number of ways, um, they can cause delays. Uh, this is in processing the final bill. For instance, if chambers aren't ready to process their final bill, or they haven't billed fast, for example. Um, and of course, this has a knock-on effect in the solicitor obtaining payment, um, not just yourself in obtaining payment as well. And I would think, as the old adage goes, turnover is vanity, profit is vanity, but cash flow is king. So I think if you're impacting on the provider's cash flow, you're not going to be up there on the Christmas card list, that's for sure. The second way is in relation to rejections. Now, rejections are quite a serious thing. It may seem like a minor matter, but it requires the provider, or me, to have to resubmit the claim. And this doesn't just mean clicking a button. This means getting all my evidence up again and re-uploading it, which can take time. And unfortunately, resubmitting claims because of rejection causes costs. So when you're not ready to put your claim in, for instance, on a Rule 16.4 Guardian case where you're billing at the end, and we've put our final bill in, and if it gets rejected because of this, we'll be told it's because of you. So just do bear that in mind that it can cause issues. And I always think it's best to try to be for everyone to work together. And again, the rejections, they delay cash flow. And worst of all, they affect the provider's KPIs. There are only a certain percentage of claims that can be rejected or reduced for the provider before the LAA comes in and contract notices start being issued. And this is an extremely serious thing for providers. So do bear in mind that if your actions are somehow causing KPI rejects, be it in relation to your billing or in relation to deficient court orders, which I'll get on to, this really isn't going to make for very happy bunnies when it comes to solicitors. And um, finally, shortfall. So again, that's impacting on the provider's profit. So this could be because um, they've been unable to recover a disbursement because the court order is sufficient. This could be because of an insufficient limitation. And the key thing to remember is that usually, but not always, it's going to come out of the solicitor's cost first, and it can be significant. I have seen shortfalls of thousands and thousands of pounds on single cases. So it is something definitely worthwhile bearing in mind. And if there's anything that you can do to prevent that or to lessen it, then that's going to make the providers happy. Um, so I just want to move on to each part of that and in a bit more detail. So delays can be caused by various uh, reasons. There's failing to provide the fee notes, in a, in a prompt matter, as I've already mentioned, council claim getting rejected. Um, also, obviously, firms firms can cause delays as well. You know, that failing to allocate costs to council on the CCMS. So I think, as Scott was saying, do diarise. If you haven't had that notification that you can, you're good to go and allocate the costs from the provider. Do chase for it and make sure you're chasing the right person because often it is the secretary you want to be speaking to, not the fee earner. Um, obviously failing to make the claims promptly. And a final thing I wanted to mention was recruitment being required. Um, for, some, for example, for some reason on CCMS, you are able to claim both on on advocates meetings, but under the contract, you are not able to claim both on an advocates meeting. Equally, for some reason, sometimes that gets through and you get a 25% uplift on an advocates meeting that you're not entitled to. Well, that means is that you're effectively getting more than you should do. I'll then come along and I'll probably ask you to recoup it or ask for a recoup because you're not entitled to it, which means it's an overclaim, which means that providers are under a duty under the contract to inform the legal aid agency that there has been an overclaim on this certificate. Then you have to do a recoup. So this causes delay, but it also sometimes means that we then have to ask for the limitation to be increased by the amount of the recoup because for some reason, and I'm sure Rob knows more about this than I do, you can't actually 
um, they can't reduce the amount that was allocated to council, even if it's been recouped once it's been paid. Um, so yes, do be careful and make sure you're checking those claims. So rejections, as I said, deficient court orders, which I'm going to go into in more detail, um, and other, other matters that you might think don't relate to you, but could do, relate to claims exceeding codified rates without prior authority, and as I said, issues with disbursements. Moving on to shortfall. This could be because of a failure to provide fee notes. If you fail to provide fee notes or you fail to provide actual estimates, then the solicitor is going to be unaware of the true level of the cost. And sometimes I've seen it, I know um, it's probably no one's fault, people are very busy, but sometimes you only see a fee note at the very end of the case. And it comes in and the solicitor should have registered at high cost. But because they were unaware of exactly what council's fees were, they haven't registered at high cost, the case is concluded, and then they are unable to register at high cost because the case is concluded. That is opportunity loss, but obviously there's going to be the cost to count because the limitation has been breached. Um, and again, I know I'm stressing about these defective orders, but they're one of the headaches that I get on a, a weekly basis, and it means that solicitors fail to recover disbursement. So it, it can mount up as well. So what can we do, uh, or what can you do, to help reduce these delays? The key thing is communicate. I cannot stress that enough. Communicate, communicate, communicate with the LAA, solicitors, with us as cost lawyers. Um, if you think there's an issue, if you have any concerns, if you, whether you're making your claims, and when you're making your claims, if we work together when putting the claims through, then there's less likely to be issues as you go along. Also, check and make your claims promptly. Check the certificate. Do you actually have scope for the work? As mentioned by Scott, it's a big issue if you weren't covered for the work you're about to do because you won't get paid, but also the solicitor's not going to get paid. So if you pick up that there isn't cover for full representation and you're about to toodle off to a final hearing, let the solicitor know so they can get that amended urgently. And then you'll both get paid for the work done. Also, are the proceedings correct? Horror story, I've seen the wrong proceedings on a certificate. Nobody got anything because it covered, a, a, I think it was a private matter that was covered and it should have been a public law claim that was covered. And also, I've got there, does the limitation look sufficient? If you think you're getting towards high cost based on just on your fees, let the solicitor know because you only, both of you will benefit in the long run. Um, and I think as we've all mentioned, do challenge. Mistakes happen, we're all human, but do challenge those incorrect projections. And if you're unsure, just email. What's the worst that could happen? They say no. Uh, turning to court orders, uh, which are quite a big issue. The main issue tends to be in relation to alcohol and drug testing fees, in relation to experts. So we're looking at the codified rates um, and the amount of time it's to be recovered. Uh, in relation to translation of documents and also the lay client's attendance at, at hearings. I'm just going to cover each of those topics in a little bit more detail. So alcohol and drug testing. Now the LAA will not pay what hasn't been ordered. So if you have an order that says test for cocaine and you go and test for cocaine and cannabis, you will not get them uh, paid for the cannabis testing. You will only get cocaine. If you have an order that says three months and then they go off and do six months, again, they're only going to get paid on a three month test. So do make sure that the order is correct. And a very important thing to bear in mind with alcohol testing is that apparently, I'm, I'm not a toxicologist, so I don't actually know for sure, but apparently you can't do accurate alcohol testing without taking a blood test. But if you put in the order just alcohol testing via hair strand um, test, then they won't actually pay for the blood test or any of the fees that stem from the blood testing. So that's a collection fee for the blood and the, um, the, the other testing fees go with that. So do be careful on that one and make sure to put the right figures. If you're not sure, don't put a figure because we have to provide the order. And if the order says it was supposed to be £450 and it turns out to be 500 the LAA are going to question that extra 50 and we're very unlikely to get it because it'll come out of one of the figures, like the collection figures, where there's a bracket of what is reasonable. Um, and also a point to beware. 
I have heard down the grapevine that certain drug testing companies are starting to request sight of a redacted order before actually undertaking the work. Now, this has caused delays in cases in having to go back and get those redacted orders. So do be mindful of that. It makes sense because if we're asking them to take hits, that you know it's happening regularly, then they're probably going to want to see the orders to make sure that they're doing the right work. Just briefly, the, the basics on prior authorities. And the reason that I mentioned this is because if you do have to have a prior authority, it takes time to get it. So please be aware of some of the, the requirements related to that. So when is the prior authority required? Whenever the expert rate exceeds the codified rate. Now the codified rate applies to most experts and uh, it, whether it's London or non-London, it applies in the same way. Um, it's also necessary when you have an unusual expert, either in nature or in the amount that they're going to charge. And it's recommended but not essential where there is an unequal apportionment. The key thing about the prior authority is it has to be applied for before the work is undertaken. So when you're looking at an order and you've got a rate that is, exceeds the codified rate, make sure to factor in enough time to allow the solicitor to actually get the prior authority, because if the expert has to start work before the prior authority has been applied for, you're, they're not going to get anything in excess of the codified rate. And regardless of what the court order says, the LEA are not bound by the order. So even if the court says this expert was required, their rates are eminently reasonable, even though they exceed the codified rate, it doesn't matter. If we don't have prior authority, we are stuck. Um, and as I said, the consequences of obtaining a prior authority are great. It means that they have a specific amount of protected from assessment later down the line, and it also protects that hourly rate if they've recovered in excess of the codified rate for future work. So once you've got it once for one expert in the case, you don't need it again for that expert unless their time is looking unusual in nature or amount. So some little tips in relation to prior authorities. I do recommend uh, for barristers it's not a bad idea to have the codified rate readily available in your bundle, some are easily accessible. Uh, do remember they take time. Um, and also try to work out and agree with the local authority what's going to happen to the shortfall if the prior authority is not obtained. It's really worthwhile getting them to agree at the time the order is done, possibly even recorded, that they will pay the shortfall. And just be aware of those unequal apportionments you need to make sure that the court has carried out an assessment of the party's needs and get it recorded in the order so that the LAA are more likely to pay the full amount if it's all been ordered to pay the certificate, uh, child certificate. In relation to translation of documents, um, again, get it recorded in the order which part of the documents are going to be translated, which documents and which part. Because if you do, this is sufficient authority for it to be funded at LAA rates. If it's not in the order, then the solicitors will want to get prior authority because unfortunately the LAA will not pay for translation um, in relation to all the documents to the care matter, only those which are central to the client understanding the essence of the local authority's case. And that can be quite limited and ends up with a massive argument generally between the provider and me and the LAA as to what was central and required and what wasn't. But it's in the court order, the LAA won't argue with it. Uh, finally, just in relation to lay clients' expenses, I appreciate we're not doing attended hearings at the moment, um, but perhaps when we start going back to it, or if you happen to have a hybrid hearing, um, the LAA take issue with lay clients' travel expenses if they weren't required to be a witness. Now, this is regardless of the fact that the, uh, the rules indicate that any party should be at every hearing as part of the proceedings. Um, so it is worthwhile putting in the order, if you know that the client's travel expenses are being funded by the solicitor, that it was necessary for them to attend, because that way the solicitor will get those travel expenses back and it won't be charged. Uh, in relation to remote hearings, what's quite interesting is that where the clients are incurring additional costs for participating, this, for example, in relation to additional data charges, this actually can be claimed as disbursement. I haven't actually come across it, but I do think it's probably worthwhile if you know that's happening or they've got pay as you go phone and they're using that, that it's covered in the order to ensure that that's been recovered. Finally, I just wanted to talk about some tips in relation to the family advocacy scheme. I know Rob's done quite a bit on it, but these are perhaps some little known areas. 
Um, now, the hearing start time, it should always run from the time that you were listed to attend, not from the time you actually attended. Um, do record any lunchtime adjournments or actually clarify it work through lunch because that is a question that we will get asked, although less so now with the remote hearings. Um, if an expert was due to give evidence but stood down less than 72 hours prior to the relevant hearing, you're still entitled to that 25% bolt on, do make sure to claim it. Now the contract allows you to claim a half advocate's meeting fee where an advocate's meeting is due to take place, but the parties are able to resolve it without the actual meeting. So for example, you're due to have an advocate's meeting before the IRH. Uh, the advocates engage in discussions via email. You then decide, we've resolved all the issues. We know each other's positions. We don't need the meeting. You can claim a half advocate's meeting fee for that. But what you should make sure to do is to put in probably your last email, somebody, well, now we have resolved all the issues. There is no need for the advocate's meeting to take place. And then use that email as evidence that you've actually met the requirements for your half advocate's meeting thing. Um, and as I mentioned before, just be aware that sometimes the CCMS allows you to do things you really shouldn't be able to do. Um, and this can cause issues, so do make sure to check those claims. Um, and also in relation to hourly rate matters, so again, the Rule 16.4 Guardian cases, technically, I've, I've been seeing quite a lot of barristers claiming the codified rate, so they're claiming the rating that's consistent with the solicitors, but you don't need to. For a family matter where you're not limited to FAS, you can actually claim hmm, any rate because it's, it's not codified. It isn't determined by the regulations. And I have seen claims successfully go through for £135 per hour. If you have one of these cases, uh, it does strike me that you might have an interest in whether the claim gets assessed by the court or the LEA once we have this option. And that's all I'm going to say on the matter. Um, so what should you do when you are unsure? As I mentioned, communicate, ask, ask the LEA. They are very approachable. Ask a friendly legal aid cost lawyer. You know, we are also approachable. Um, and also your instructing solicitor or perhaps maybe their secretary because they'll know what to do. And if you are going to contact the LAA, my favourite, favourite way is the web chat. I cannot stress enough how useful the web chat is. It is instant. It is a real person. It's not a bot, which is brilliant. I hate it when you're on, on the uh, web and it's, you find out it's a bot. And they can actually assist on case-specific queries. I've actually spoken to somebody through web chat about a limitation that was at the wrong figure and they went in and they changed it there and then which was incredibly helpful and so honestly that would be my one recommendation out of everything is use the web chat and um, thank you ever so much for having me and that's the end of my presentation thanks very much uh, scott rob and charlotte for all of those useful tips and tricks um, we've got about half an hour left and there's lots of questions that have been flowing in. So let, let's crack on with them. Um, the first question I'm, I'm going to feel to Scott, because I think this is probably one that you could deal with. Um, Scott, I don't know if you've actually, uh, you can see the questions up there. I can indeed. Um, yeah. Okay. It might be helpful if we uh, just ask you to put the question out loud so that everyone knows the subject you're going to be dealing with. And then if you wouldn't mind dealing with it for us, thank you. Yep, no problem. So this was a, a can I say a little bit more about underruns and uh, about where and how they apply. So it's different, as I said before, it's different in FAS under the special COVID rules and it's different in uh, normal FAS uh, and it's different in single council VHCC and two council VHCC. So you need to know the differences between them. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going on advocates meetings and it's underruns, sorry. I've skipped ahead to something else. I saw somebody else's question. I'm just going to talk about underruns now. So um, if, uh, if a main hearing is vacated within five working days of the start date of the hearing um, and the listing is no longer required, so effectively a case goes short. Um, within five working days of when it was due to start, the case has gone short, it's cracked, it's finished. You can claim underruns for all the days that didn't happen. That's easy enough. Then it starts to get a bit trickier. If um, 
uh, it was vacated more than five working days beforehand, you probably will not be able to claim. It's very rare that you'll be able to because the, the idea is that you've known far enough in advance to be able to stop your preparation and but therefore that the LA won't pay a fee. There is some wiggle room there. If it was a particularly lengthy case, you know, if it's listed for six, eight weeks, then your preparation will have started a lot longer before the case than five days beforehand. So you can argue that point with the LAA, but you've got to put it in your justification when you're claiming it. Um, where it gets a bit fiddly is around the um, what happens if a case gets adjourned and then relisted. So technically, you can't claim the underruns for that. Doesn't matter if it's five days before or five days after. If it's adjourned and relisted, that's tough. However, the LAA will listen if you feel that there's a good reason to claim for wasted preparation. So, you know, if I had it, um, especially at the start of pandemic, everything was being vacated and the LAA were very uh, helpful when it came to those sorts of hearings. I had three people in a 15 day hearing right at the start of, I think it was the 1st of April, and it all got wiped it was relisted for may it had to or may or july and eventually went ahead in july so there was a huge gap in time sort of three or four months between the two hearings everyone was fully prepared ready to go for day one it couldn't happen they turned up on day one and it couldn't no no it was it was vacated a little, little bit before and no it was no they turned up on day one it was vacated we shouldn't have been able to claim underruns because they were being relisted but they did allow it so um you do have to justify it though with the LAA and you can't just think, I'll just shove it in, they'll pay it because they won't. So if it's been uh, vacated by judicial order more than five working days before the hearing, you probably can't claim it. If it's less than five days before the hearing and that concludes the case, you definitely can claim it. And if it's in the middle, you need to think about whether you can or can't. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot of wiggle room there. So you really need to think about it. The LAA might not allow you all of your underruns. They might say, well, it's not gone off that far. We'll allow you 50% of your underruns because to allow for that wasted preparation. Um, but I think in cases where a case gets adjourned and relisted to another date and you know it's just one of those things and original counsel is not available for the future dates, the LAA are very amenable. They understand that is wasted preparation. That person through no fault of their own can't do the future dates. That's not their fault. The fact that it was adjourned is not their fault. They've done the preparation and they understand that. So they, they are very amenable on that. So that's uh, where you go with that. I think I think that covers it unless that's I've missed that. anything. No, that's very helpful. And um, I think what we're taking from that is, is it's worth a go. Yeah, yeah, speak to okay. the LAA and, and, and go for it. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Um, I think the, the next question uh, from Mark uh, is probably a question for you, Rob. Um, have you got it up there? It's uh, really some more information about the interim case plan. Uh, solicitors don't really like having to do it because it's extra work. Uh, can it be very basic with council's fees, maybe just being the only thing uh, being increased on the, on the plan? Um, it's a pretty short answer, I'm afraid. It's unfortunately a no. Um, we'd need to have everything in, in the interim case plan. Um, how, you know, how you discuss that with your solicitor is probably a massive for, for, for you guys to, to discuss. I don't know if Scott or Charlotte have got any experience on that one in having those discussions in terms of what works. Uh, but certainly from an LAA point of view, I, that's not an exception that we could make, I'm afraid. So I do apologise for that one, Mark, but it would be um, the, the full information in the interim case plan as normal. Okay. Having said that, though, the, the full information on the interim case plan is very different from the final case plan. The final case plan is when they need all the evidence, all the back sheets, all the court orders, everything sort of set out and very clear. In the interim case plan, I mean, what we're talking about interim case plan, we're talking about the CCFS form. If you go on the LAA website that, that I put up earlier, download the CCFS form and look at that. There are various sections. The solicitors have to include what the case is about, what counsel's fees are, what the expert's fees are, what their fees are. But for an interim case plan, that's all they need. They don't need all the justification behind it. So all the orders and all the, the other bits and bobs. There's a, um, a fast checklist which tells you exactly what needs to be included on an interim case plan. And uh, Anthony Leal says, um, the, the head of the, the high cost case team says, it is a soft touch approach with that. They're looking to just make sure that all the bases are covered. They get the final justification when the final case plan's done. So it's less onerous on the solicitors to do it, but they still have to fill in the CCFS form, which, you know, is a bit fiddly. Thank you very much, Scott. Scott, I think the next question, I'm just taking them in order, it is for you. Um, and it's a question specifically about, uh, from a fees clerk perspective, um, do you have any pro forma billing that you're going to be willing to share? I don't know if there's anything in the literature that you've been involved in drafting to assist with dealing with the VHCC cases. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, there's, we don't have a 
great deal for we have we used to have really complex ones for fast cases and we have quite complex ones for um non fast hourly rate 164 cases which we, we give to barristers sort of timesheets to fill in but for for vhcc cases they're quite simple it tends to be a little note that i provide to them every time they have a vhcc case setting out i need your back sheets i need your attendance notes for advocates meetings and, and conferences um setting out some of the, the sort of managing expectations bits but if you've got um if anybody wants to drop me an email afterwards it's my email addresses in the slides and if you want to, any specific things that you want it, it's it's really it's more about the processes i think what we do what i do have quite a lot of is, is email templates that are sent to solicitors you know that just say please see attached cost estimate i think this case is going to go to vhcc because i think the costs are going to be more than twenty five thousand. or please see attached cost estimate because the timetables change significantly so i use things like that but um I, I don't have anything major like that but if anybody wants to drop me a email, I'll, I'll happily share with you anything that i can that's uh, non-sensitive thank you scott that's really helpful the next question from chris is for you rob and uh that question is in relation to interim hearings fast um in particular, councils claimed uh, final hearing and paid as such. This are contacted before their final bill to say PFC. Can you just tell us, Rob, very quickly what PFC is so those that don't know can be informed? Yep, that would be the uh, public, publicly funded client. Thank you. Specifically didn't cover final hearing, so council couldn't claim as final. Chambers contacted by CCM. CCM, sorry, that question's just moved up as someone else has answered one. Uh, I've lost it. Sorry, uh, there it is, Chris's question, yeah. Uh, contacted by, by a CCMS to ask if recruitment therefore required, um, as PFC didn't cover the final hearing, CCMS reply says no, can claim and be paid as final hearing solicitor unsure of this. Can you clarify, please? Yep, those are probably just worth me quickly saying um, PFC can be publicly funded client or public funding certificate. And I was mistaken in this one. It's the second one. They're talking about the certificate. Right. Um, these are, this is the wonderful vagaries of FAS. You wish it would be straightforward and simple in some of these instances, but it's not. There are instances where an interim hearing can be paid as a final. I don't know the specifics of this case, so I can't specifically advise what the answer would be, unfortunately. Um, but if it was um, a private law case and you had a finding of fact hearing um, that re resolves proceedings, uh, we could pay that as a final hearing. Um, likewise, in a care case, if you go to the IRH and that resolves proceedings, we can pay that as a final hearing as well. So if it's one of those, yeah, then yes, the payment as a final hearing is correct. What is quite clear in the contract, though, if you have an interim hearing, so a case management conference that finalises proceedings, that's not a final hearing. That would be an interim hearing. And if it was that hearing, then yes, we would need to arrange the recruitment. The recruitment. So I'm not sure what the specifics of the case are. It's very much based on the specifics of that hearing. Um, and you'll either be able to hopefully take that up with the instructing solicitor or with uh, with ourselves. We may, we may have made a mistake ourselves um, based on what the hearing was. So hopefully that does answer that question for you. Thank you, Rob. Ne next question is going to Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, uh, can you help us with this one? Um, it's one of those scenarios that um, we can all relate to as counsel stuck at court. Uh, but to sh summarize Diane's question, Diane is asking in, in a particular set of circumstances where uh, no doubt she was counsel uh, required to attend at 11 um, and due to be heard, I think at, at 12, listed at 12, um, things didn't move on. Um, she didn't get into court, waited to be contacted by the court, matter was listed, waited until five o'clock, um, never been contacted by the court, uh, sending messages into the administration to see if things could um, be explained. I think Diane's question carries on a bit further down, so just rolling down a bit. Um, yes, yeah, so she was making inquiries of the court, uh, obviously made fairly extensive inquiries, um, and there was no order, unfortunately, as a result of all of that. Um, the other side representing themselves, so poor old Diane seems to be stuck at court all day, no order to verify the arrangements. These things seem to be common in London and South East courts. Any guidance would be appreciated, Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, my understanding, and I think Rob, might also be um, unaudible on this one, um, is that because it was listed to be a hearing and it wasn't effectively cancelled, um, that you should be able to claim your time that you were waiting. So in this instance, from the time it was listed uh, for you to be available from 11am up to the point I would suggest that you did not realise it was going to continue, 
I said your evidence is re- your trouble is really the evidence on that, and maybe Rob could assist with that one as to what you'd be looking for. Yeah, it, I mean it's a tricky one because in, in an ideal world, you kind of say, well, that's a cancelled hearing, and we have the cancelled hearing fee for that. But obviously, you having good faith been there, and it's not like the court have come out and said, sorry, we can't hold the hearing. The courtroom's been double booked. You know, it's a thing that happens. Um, what we would say is we'd probably make a, a sort of evidence-based assessment on it based on how much time you have reasonably been, been waiting to be called. It may well be that we'd look at that and think, you know, we've been, you've been waiting around for six hours. I don't know if we can necessarily pay all of that time because there's a chance that you could have realised earlier, you could have got in touch with the court earlier. There's all manner of different evidence, evidential issues that would need to be weighed up. But in theory, um, we, we can make a payment decision based on the specific facts of the case. Um, and if you're not sure, as Charlotte said, um, you know, if you have more details, you can contact us through the live chat f- feature. Um, I think they are rolling that out full time for being able to contact us about anything. And they'll be able to, with the specific facts of the case, obviously in that private setting, be able to give much more specific advice about what the fixed fee that would apply. Um, I'm presuming it was a case under FAS um, that would apply to that, to that case. So that would be my, my, my first recommendation is collect all the evidence. Um, and then if you can present that to us, um, either in a, an inquiry in CCMS or an inquiry to the live chat function, and we'll try and answer that question for you specifically. Thank you, Rob. Can I just ask a follow on question from Diane's query, uh, just in terms of evidencing what she was doing? Um, She obviously sent an email to the court administrator at some point, and then a bit later on, she was trying to make phone calls. But would it be more sensible to just try and keep on emailing? Because then you've got the document to say, I'm still at court, really set out what you'd want to say to uh, anyone that's looking at your bill. I'm still at court. I haven't had a response. I've been here for X number of hours. Would that help in terms of trying to evidence um, what was going on? Yeah, very much so. Um, I, emails are obviously ideal because they're stamped, uh, but that doesn't mean that um, certified attendance notes that you've got are, are unacceptable too, that they are absolutely acceptable. So if you've been on the phone and been on hold and had that issue, an attendance note would be fine um, if you've not been doing it by email. Thank you. That's very helpful indeed. Next question is for you, Charlotte. Um, uh, Natalie missed a little bit about your defective orders. Uh, could you just explain a little bit about the most common errors in orders? Yes, of course. Um, the most common errors I tend to find are in relation to drug and alcohol testing. So um, not setting out which drugs, uh, the duration of the testing, um, or that there's uh, blood testing required. Um, in relation to uh, translation, not setting out the documents that are required. Um, putting in uh, costs uh, for, for, say, drug testing or other experts, and that fee being wrong, that can cause an issue, uh, although sometimes you can rectify that, obviously, on the slip rule. Um, and, sorry, my mind's gone slightly blank there. Um, I'm so sorry, my dog shook behind me and it totally <laughs> threw me. Um, and there was there was something else. Um, I I'm, I'm so sorry. I can't I can't remember. Not to worry at all, Charlotte. But there's a follow-on question from Jane uh, in relation to that point about missing things in the order. For example, your uh, um, the example you gave of of maybe adding only one uh, substance when in fact you've um, tested for several. Uh, Jane's asking if those errors uh, can be corrected in subsequent orders to rectify uh, the position after the event. Is is that possible? I have seen it, and in the cases where I've seen it, it has been um, accepted. Uh, It's more of an issue if you get all the way to the end of the case, I think, because trying to get something amended under the slip ball once the case is actually finished and you've had the work done is um, extremely difficult and um, so I have remembered the other thing I was going to mention, it was in relation to experts and the rates exceeding codified rates and not allowing for any shortfalls in the local authority. That's what you Super, thanks. Uh, Rob, just to, just to ask you that, that point about correcting orders after the event, is that something that the legal aid agency would accept? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, if it's for a prior authority and the prior authority is no longer prior, then that becomes a problem in its own right. But in principle, yes, it's absolutely fine. We have no problem with that at all. Lovely, thank you very much. Got a question from Tor, um, who's asking um, cases becoming high cost after fast payments. Should council's bill show all events at high cost rate, then deduct prior fast payments to show a net claim? Recently, cost draftsman suggested that the bill should show the total high cost and let the LAA 
LAA, forgive me, claim the previous fast payments as a recruitment? Is, is that a logical way to approach it? To be honest with you, it entirely dep depends on the solicitor and the cost draftsman on this. The LAA don't care. The LAA know how much has been claimed and how much you're claiming, so it doesn't matter to them. Their fee note, the fee note that you send into the LAA, is is just proof of what your your final bill is really. Um, but for um, for I've had some solicitors. Um, say to me that they want the fee note just showing events and not showing the fast that's already been claimed and paid and I've amended it manually just to show it for them I mean it's, it's, it's fine it doesn't make a great difference but for in terms of what the LAA get I send them just a standard fee note we, we record everything on the one fees page so we've got the fast claims left on there and paid and then we put the events on as additional lines different sets do different things they'll set up their own separate case it's entirely how you do it but if someone requests it in a certain way then send it in a certain way but it makes no difference to the LAA they the LAA will take it in whatever way it comes because they know what they've paid at FAS rates they will offset that against the final claim so if you've had five grand's worth of fast paid and your final bill's 25 they'll pay you 20 it's really simple so it makes no odds. Thank you Scott that's very helpful. Um, Connor has a question, um, Charlotte I think this was your area that you covered, with the specific emails between the parties need to be provided with the final claim in order to claim the 50% advocates meeting fee? The LAA do require um, evidence and where we've claimed it for solicitors it has involved the email now, you might want to redact those emails because, of course, they do have privilege. I mean, as, as Rob said, they are, they are the paying party. They are entitled to see um, information, but you may not want them to see all the information. And I think as long as you've got that evidence in email form, yes, it will be expected because they, just, they won't just pay one because it was ordered and you say it happened. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, another question on the advocates meeting. Um, how do you claim half an advocates meeting fee on Lex? Uh, as it's fixed, a fixed fee on Lex. How do you do that technically? Well, uh, for solicitors, uh, maybe Scott knows this for, for Council for sure, but for solicitors, what you do is you put it through an advocacy summary and you claim it as a fixed amount on advocate summary and that gets it through. But you will get asked, you will definitely get asked, what is this? So you do have to explain what it is uh, when you deal with the notifications, but that's how we will get it through. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question. Um, Scott, I, I wonder whether this is one for you. Um, uh, there is a matter which is high cost single council events, which is uh, over 15 advocates meeting, supported by an order at interim stage. Will these all get paid? So as long as they've all been ordered in advance, yes. No problem in single council cases. Um, the original um, uh, PLO, um, envisaged two advocates meetings per set of proceedings and so the LAA costed things on that basis but they uh, agreed that as time's gone on things have changed and so they do allow them as long as they're ordered by the court. What they won't do in high cost cases is the parties organise them between themselves and decide that they're just going to have one um, and then they get the judge to retrospectively order it. They will not pay those at events rates. It's very simple that, that that's just absolutely not right and that's clear in the guidance and the interim guidance that they brought out for or, um, COVID-19 special measures because under normal fast regs you can't retrospectively uh, claim for a retrospectively ordered uh, advocates meeting it has to be ordered in advance by the court these were special measures brought in just for COVID-19 and just for fast cases. That's very helpful indeed. Um, can I just ask a quick question about email hearings that you spoke about Rob? Um, you spoke about the um, uh, LAA being willing to pay for email hearings. Are, are those hearings where um, you may have done a um, interactive hearing with the judge uh, and there, uh, there are hangover issues, issues that haven't quite finished in the case and the judge says, well, okay, fine, I'm not going to deal with those today. Um, you can email me about that and if you can't agree this point, I'll deal with it as a separate dispute, which effectively results in another hearing. Is that sort of hearing uh, a claimable hearing? I mean, yeah, but how, how you claim it would obviously be the interesting question because it may be a case that we would want to consider it, uh, an extension of the initial hearing. It really depends how the court and the judge have specifically defined what's being done um, as the follow up. So if they are saying, actually, you know, here's the order, this is this hearing, we've got this separate issue that we're going to deal with by email and it's going to be a separate hearing, then yeah, that would be um, a separate, a separate uh, 
time calculation, a separate fee under FAS. But if it was actually just sort of a, you know, like a short adjournment and then you concluded it by email, that would count as part of the over, overarching hearing that it was, um, that it stemmed from. So really, again, it's another one that depends on the specifics of the case, you know, trying, trying to be flexible uh, with, with FAS um, and the rules as we, as we can be given, given yes. the new reality. So it, it would kind of depend on how very specifically the judge had defined um, yes. that additional work you'd undertaken, if that, if that makes sense. So, so if there wasn't an order that listed it as a separate hearing, but it was a sort of extension of the hearing, um, would it be sensible to include on the face of the order that that aspect of the case had to be dealt with in this way, might entitle someone to a separate hearing unit, for example, if it pro prolonged the hearing? Yeah, absolutely. Or if the court put in the, in the end, um, you know, the hearing concluded at three o'clock, but we spent another two hours discussing by email, then that would be another two hours bolted on to the end as well. So it, it depends on, on how they've defined that in the evidence that you submit to us. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, a question from uh, Diane uh, about, uh, I think, Scott, this, this one is going to come to you. Cases listed for, for HEDRA and brief says instructor for, he for HEDRA. Council attends, final hearing um, is made, final forgive me, order is made after submissions. Council claims final hearing, but Clark say not a final hearing because it wasn't listed as such and evidence wasn't heard. So this to say no scope for final hearing. So if we claim for final hearing, that could trigger fees being recouped and potential KPIs being affected. Council asks the rest of the team and they all agree should be a final hearing. What do you say, Scott? Nope, never, never, never a final hearing. If it's listed for a, for a final hearing to be claimed, it must be listed to be heard as a final hearing and a final order made. So uh, a, a directions hearing, which is what uh, for Hydra is, is, is not a final hearing. It's not listed to be dealt with as a final hearing. And so therefore it can never be a final hearing. The LA will not pay it as a final hearing. If there's no scope on the certificate, you won't be able to claim it as a final hearing. It's never a final hearing. Thank you, that's clear. Uh, next question. Uh, for Charlotte, uh, if the final hearing, sorry, if final hearings are not vacated within five days before due to start, but they are utilised as uh, case management hearings, can they count towards the over 10 days need to get to the events? Um, so this will be in relation to BHCCs and uh, presumably, so you, what you've got there is technically it's an underrun that's been listed. So it wouldn't be an underrun because it's been listed to take place at another day. It's been utilized as a case management hearing. So it hasn't proceeded as a final hearing. It also needs to proceed as a final hearing. So it would just be, it would be an event, but it wouldn't count towards your 10 days. That would be my understanding. Okay, so you can't use that to get to your over 10 days. No, it's only, you're finding a fact hearing days and your final hearing days um, and essentially you've got a day that's been moved on um so you wouldn't count it twice that would be how you're reading that okay all right thank you next question um i'm going to ask rob if you don't mind dealing with it uh, what happens with two council uh, family graduated fee cases when authority is granted halfway through what happens to prior fees if the silk um silk's involvement ends what happens to juniors fees after this I'm going to put my hands up on this one and say I'm not actually entirely sure. Scott, is this one you know? Because if yeah. not, I can take it away and find out. <laughs> no, it's fine. I know this one. So uh, the minute um, a case becomes high cost, the fees stay throughout. So the minute it's two council FGF, they remain throughout the case. Whether the silk dips out after the advocate uh, after the fact finding hearing, it doesn't matter. It, it remains as high cost, and the, all of the fees that happened before and everything that comes after are recalculate those rates. I did have a weird thought about this though. I thought, what about a case? Where where Silk's in, uh, only in for the fact-finding hearing. That's listed for eight days, say, and it finishes. And then the Silk involvement ends, but there's no final hearing listed and we think it might be one or two days. It kind of kicks off and bumbles along and then it ends up going for five days. I think that'd all be recalculated as events, but then the Silk might have claimed fees. I think that's a weird one. I think it would probably all be recalculated events at that point, but it'd be weird, a weird situation where you didn't know it was gonna happen. Um, you'd probably have a good inkling at that stage anyway. So I think it's one to, to check out. But yeah, it, it, effectively, all fees, once a case is VHCC, all fees can become VHCC. Um, they can all become events or FGF, depending on what it's being paid at. 
Okay, thank you very much, Scott. I think we're going to have to make this one our, our last question. Um, it's a question that I'm going to ask uh, Rob, if you don't mind dealing with. If a final hearing is listed for two days, but concludes in one day, would it be possible to claim for both days if this was not done at the time of billing the case? Um, so it really depends how we would, uh, again, what, what's really happened. So you can certainly have the one day. For the second day, um, even if you've, I mean, even if you've only been there for five minutes, it's a day fee, so it still counts as a day fee. But if nothing's gone ahead, we'll pay for the actual days that we're at court. Um, potentially, um, there may be an argument about a, cance about a cancellation fee for the final hearing if it's listed separately as a different thing. But the chances are that it's going to be under FAS, just the one, the one hearing. Um, the one day for the one fee. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that brings us to an end of our question and answer session. I'm very sorry if we didn't get to the last few questions, uh, but I think we've managed to cover quite a lot of ground. Um, I know Scott and Rob are always very amenable to helping. If there is a, um, I'm not going to give them a lot of homework, but if there are a few short further questions, uh, I'm. I imagine they would probably be willing to answer those briefly for you. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. I'm grateful. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, all that remains is for us to thank you for attending today. Um, and to ask you, please, uh, we'd be very grateful indeed if you could complete an email survey that's going to be sent out to you. It would help the Bar Council enormously to um, understand um, and tailor the uh, seminars and work that they uh, undertake. So please do look out for that and, and please do, if you could find a few minutes, complete that. The next legal aid billing seminar is a civil non-family uh, seminar that, that will be taking place on the 16th of June, six o'clock to 7.30. You can register with the Bar Council on their website. And um, if it's uh, an area that would be useful to you, I'm sure the speakers will be equally excellent. But may I just thank all of our speakers tonight for giving up their time and the uh, enormous amounts of work and preparation that goes into presenting something as smoothly and slickly as they have tonight. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're very grateful. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Good night. <laughs>